This is I Hear Things for Friday, June 25th, 2021. Podcasting, audiobooks, and the third thing. A couple of weeks ago, the Audio Publishers Association, which is the trade organization for the audiobook business, put out their annual state of the industry research, and I'll link to that in the show notes. And the findings continue to be pretty good news, I think, for authors, publishers, and narrators, and I know people in all three categories. Uh, So my company, Edison, has been the research partners to the APA for about a decade or so, and it's been really gratifying to be involved with both audiobooks and podcasting during a period that I think you can only describe as a, a renaissance or a renaissance for spoken word audio. Among the findings in the APA research was this data point from uh, a special audiobook cut of our share of ear research, and that is that the share of listening to audiobooks compared to other forms of audio has grown 60% since 2017. Now, when you combine that with the fact that podcasting's share of ear has actually tripled since 2014, it's not hard to see why spoken word has really increased its overall footprint over the last six years. Uh, And music has actually declined, and we reported this in our collaboration with NPR, the Spoken Word Audio Report. Since 2014, music's uh, overall share in terms of all of the audio that we listen to, music has declined by 8%, and spoken word has grown by 30%. Now, that's not a stat to take lightly. Most Americans mostly listen to mostly music. I'll let you say that three times fast, because I can't. Uh, such a grand shift in behavior is, it's not really common. It is a significant shift. With the amount of time we spend listening to audio being relatively unchanged over that period of time, it's been about four hours a day uh, throughout that entire period. That means it's not just that spoken word audio has grown as audio has grown. It's actually more of a zero-sum game than that. Spoken word audio has taken share from music. What we've seen over the last five years is really a mix of content innovation, but also business model innovation. You see that both on the podcasting side and the audiobook side. And it's led to both media growing in reach and frequency of listening. Now, there are plenty of people who do one or the other, listen to podcasts or audiobooks, of course. But there are enough who listen to both to make some really interesting observations about the, the intersection between the two and how they're perceived as different. For many of those people, podcasts are where they turn to learn something new, uh, while audiobooks are what they listen to for relaxation, to kind of lean back. But does it need to be that way? Is there something endemic to the format of either that dictates these perceptions? I don't think so. Instead, I think the two mediums are going to continue to cross-pollinate each other and maybe even create, here in all caps, a third thing. When I was an undergrad at Tufts here in Boston, where I live, I took a course called The Literature of Chaos, which was an exploration of existential literature, you know, Camus, Sartre, Beavis, Butthead, all the the classics. I I can't say that many of those authors really stuck with me over the years, except one, Jorge Luis Borges. And I think I was a a sophomore then. I had a pretty heavy class load, uh, and so I think I gravitated towards Borges because his his works were, were very, very short. He wrote extremely short pieces. Uh, He wrote what I suppose you would call short stories, but in reality, they were their own dog. They were a literary vehicle entirely of Borges' creation. The stories of Borges were not exactly between a short story and a novel. In fact, in some cases, they were shorter than short stories, but they hovered over them. They They were kind of a third thing. The style that Borges developed is a great example of the power of constraints, I think. When Borges was a child in Argentina, he became extraordinarily well-read in both Spanish and English. He he had read all of Shakespeare as a child. By the time he was a young man, he had just utter command of the masterworks of both literature and philosophy. And he also had horrible eyesight. By the time he hit 30, a combination of myopia and cataracts had gotten so bad that he was just starting to have terrible accidents. He'd bash his head on window frames. He'd have very bad falls. Uh, And after a couple of really good whacks to the head from some of these falls, he suffered a detached retina in his one good eye. And that was it. Uh, As a young man, Borges became blind after having grown up reading all of these masterworks of literature and, and writing. So his entire career was based on reading and writing literature. And in the middle of his life, 
he lost the ability to do either in the same way again. He never learned to read Braille. So instead, he had his mother and some hired help read books to him and also transcribe what he would dictate. And that was how he wrote uh, as an adult. Basically, he would dictate his works to his mother or to others. Uh, And this new constraint that he had contributed to something really marvelous. Now, imagine that everything you knew about literature came from reading Shakespeare or Tolstoy, let's say. And then in the middle of your career as a reader and a writer of literature, you had to switch from reading War and Peace to having it read to you by your mother. Let me tell you this. I love audiobooks, and I've worked with the Audio Publishers Association and Audible and a bunch of others in the space for years. There is no freaking way I am listening to 61 hours of War and Peace as an audiobook. I'm not. Now imagine trying to conceive and write War and Peace without ever putting a pen to paper. Imagine trying to conceptualize in your mind and then narrate a 61-hour audiobook. If Tolstoy had written War and Peace under the same conditions that Borges wrote his Ficciones, I highly doubt War and Peace would have been over 587 87,000 words long. Thank you for that. I'm going to keep that because we don't edit. Um, Instead of writing the kinds of long novels that he had studied as a younger man, he simply imagined that these novels that he might write already existed. And he wrote short pieces about encountering these completely imaginary novels as if they had, in fact, already been written. So not quite a short story and not the cliff notes of a book, but an entirely different experience altogether, kind of fantasy as it were, of a book that never existed. Uh, Borges himself described the process like this, and he said, I quote, The composition of vast books is a laborious and impoverishing extravagance. A better course of procedure is to pretend that these books already exist, and then to offer a resume, a commentary, more reasonable, more inept, more indolent. I have preferred to write notes upon imaginary books. Uh, my favorite of these short works is the story Talan Ukbar Orbis Tertius, which tells the story of the lost country of Ukbar somewhere in Asia Minor, and the fantastical stories of the world of Talan that made up Ukbar's mythology. All of this was made up, uh, and it was sort of written from the perspective of Borges himself and a friend stumbling upon lost artifacts. Now, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien would have turned the stories of Talan into a, a trilogy of novels and maybe six Peter Jackson movies. But as dictated by Borges, Talan Ukbar Orbis Tertius was just 5,600 words long, or about twice the length of this podcast, which doesn't say much for my editing. I just told you I don't do it. Uh, I bring Borges up because I'm fascinated by the third thing, which I think he created and what I'm calling here. Uh, I get to work with both podcasting companies and audiobook publishers, and it's my job to help them understand their audiences. And the streams of both industries They've been crossing for some time now. Uh, Look at S-Town, right? What was S-Town but an audiobook that was brought to you by Blue Apron instead of purchased using a credit on Audible? And just as Talan Ukbar Orbis Tertius was not the story of Ukbar, but the story of Borges excavating the story of Ukbar, so too was S-Town the story of its author, Brian Reed, encountering the story of S-Town. And you get a similar sense from uh, Odyssey, Pineapple Street's recent Stay Away from Matthew McGill, which starts out as the story of Matthew McGill, but it's really the story of Eric Manel, the, the journalist who excavated McGill's life. We think we know what a podcast is, and we think we know what an audiobook is. But are we sure about that as these streams continue to cross and potentially create the third thing? I've done a lot of qualitative interviews with people who are either brand new to podcasting or have heard of podcasting but not yet really listened to one, but they have opinions, right? And you know what they tell me what a podcast is? That's right. An audio enclosure in an RSS feed. No, I'm just kidding. They don't, they don't say that. No, to many people who I talk to who aren't really that acquainted with podcasting or new to podcasting, a podcast is simply someone sharing their opinion about something. That's it. That's the form to which they've been exposed in some way, and that's informed their received wisdom about the medium. A podcast is just some person with a mic and an opinion. And I suppose... S-Town and Stay Away from Matthew McGill are, at their heart, some dude with a mic and an opinion, and by the way, a Winnebago full of production staff. But I'm sure we can all agree that podcasting continues to push those boundaries. 
Podcast producers are learning from all kinds of sources, right? The audiobook industry, the radio industry, even the TV industry, and the medium's evolving. The audiobook industry, too, is learning from podcasting. We're starting to see a lot more original, straight-to-audio works in the audiobook industry. We're seeing more short audiobooks, under three hours, being made available and becoming popular. And people are spending credits on these or, or buying them outright. Audible's production of West Cork sits right at the intersection of everything that the marriage of an audiobook and a podcast could be. The audio design, the production, and the storytelling container of a podcast, but the structure and the grand narrative arc of a great novel. Is it a podcast? Is it an audiobook? Now your answer might change depending on where you listen to it or how it's monetized. I still think there's great innovation possible in the audiobook space, and I think potentially disruptive innovation. Audiobooks continue to largely be the narration of art that was meant to be read and not heard. We buy audiobooks because we enjoy the convenience of being able to enjoy a book while we're driving or doing chores, or because we enjoy the prowess of a great narrator, or even so that we can finish a book more quickly by squeezing it into parts of our day where we couldn't exactly read. But a book in its native form was written for the eye and not the ear. As I'm recording this podcast now, I'm doing it from a thing I have written. And as I look at what I have written, I have changed it in numerous ways so that it sounds better than it reads, right? Uh, I will change these things in the moment as I'm reading through what I wrote, or I won't change them in the moment. But the ability to change that text as you read it, that's not a luxury that most audiobook narrators have. I mean, sure, go ahead and edit Sue Grafton on the fly, Mr. N is for narrator, or you will get V for vengeance. And that's why I think the fact that Malcolm Gladwell has turned into a pretty good podcaster is potentially such an important thing for the audiobook industry. The audio version of his latest book, The Bomber Mafia, isn't simply a book with additional audio interviews. The whole book was written to be spoken, and I hope more writers follow suit and really rethink the audiobook as more than just a narration of their written word. Most writers don't think or write like podcasters. What's scanned so well on a page can suddenly feel stilted or turgid when you read it aloud, and even just writing and saying stilted or turgid sounds stilted and turgid. I'm sorry about that. You can see why Borges just kind of skipped to the good parts in his stories. Traditional exposition just doesn't work orally, right? It doesn't work in podcasting any more than it does in TV or in the movies. You have access to different tools. But I think it's nonfiction that could spark the most innovation here, especially in audiobooks. Personally, I'm myself not a consumer of business audiobooks, for example. My learning preference is text. I know people will say, I learn visually or I learn orally or I learn. Those are preferences, by the way, not, they're not set in stone. But it's certainly my preference to learn by text. Uh, and I'm someone who juggles a few books at once. So if I'm reading a business book, I might also be reading a fiction book, maybe two. And if I've put the business book down, I can easily pick it back up where I left off because I can scan back a little through the pages, right? I can pick up the context to remind myself of what I had been reading before, before I plow into a new chapter. Well, with an audiobook, you can't do that. You just pick it up mid-sentence sometimes, and you have to immediately contextualize what you're hearing with what you can recall from prior listening sessions. And sometimes I don't do a good job with that, so I, I find it hard. But think about what a podcast does with that same content. It's broken up into chapter-like episodes, but it's not just chapterizing things. Each episode has an intro that catches you up. It has an outro that will contextualize what you just heard and tease what is to come. Sometimes there are even mid-episode breaks, and brought to you by BetterHelp, uh, with a more helpful staging and contextualizing kind of break in the middle of the action. Even if it has been a month between episodes, these mechanics enable the listener to pick up with any episode in the middle of a narrative arc and very quickly be able to get back into the flow of whatever that book is. Why couldn't audiobooks do the same thing? As far as what podcasting can learn from audiobooks, well, there's plenty, and let's start here. People pay for audiobooks. In a world in which consumers get all-you-can-eat movies on Netflix and all-you-can-eat music on Pandora and Spotify, audiobooks have retained their value for publishers and authors. While you can check audiobooks out of public libraries for free, the latest John Grisham audiobook commands the same list price as the hardcover book, or at least one of a finite number of credits from a monthly subscription service like Audible. Audible. 
in a world where streaming music artists make pennies a song, and podcast industry experts question whether or not any kind of subscription model can really work, audiobooks keep chugging along, selling individual titles, and providing value to listeners and creators alike. And so I come back to the third thing, the thing that is crafted with all of the creative force of the novelist or biographer, but designed from the ground up to be heard, not just through sound design, but packaged for easy, episodic consumption and written to be heard and not read. The thing that we can easily listen to like a podcast, but that we pay directly for like a movie rental. It might be windowed. It might be priced differently over time like movies are. It resists the lean forward perception of the podcast or the lean back perception of the audiobook. It can be what it needs to be. The third thing, it's not the audio version of a book and it's not the transcription of a podcast. It's the atomic unit of the core idea or story. I think my wife Tamsin would call it the red thread. Uh, Produced from scratch, one way for the eye and from scratch, another completely different way for the ear. I'll give you an example. I'm a heavy consumer of audiobooks, but I don't listen, as I mentioned, to kind of business books. Never in a million years would I listen to an audiobook version of my behavioral economics hero, Nobel Prize winning economist Daniel Kahneman and his book, Thinking Fast and Slow. Very influential book to me, fantastic book. I read it. I'm personally not going to process that book uh, in the audio version. But a ground-up reimagining of that work for audio consumption could be created. It would sound like a podcast. It would have all of the contextual elements, the staging, the intro, the outro, the chapterization, and it would convey the full force of Kahneman's red thread in a format that's much more conducive to the oral tradition than simply reading the book aloud, right? You get the idea. This is more than listener-driven innovation. It's idea-driven innovation. And that, I think, is the real work of building the third thing. Next week, I will be back with more on listener surveys, including something I think uh, you'll be excited about. Lots of people are thinking about doing their own listener survey. In last week's show, I talked about how you can go about field one, but there remains the question of the questions. And uh, I've got something very special lined up for you next week. So be sure and subscribe to the podcast, subscribe to the newsletter, to the I Hear Things newsletter, at tomwebster.media. And until next week, I am Tom Webster. We'll see you then.